Well, hi, Kepler families. Welcome to another live. Today, we're talking to an art and art history teacher, something that is particularly exciting for me. So I'm welcoming Mary Margaret Holcomb. Hi. Hi. So we're talking about your class, How to Look at Art, a study of art and its history through art theory uh, for all high school ages this coming year. Uh, but before we get into the, into the meat of the class, and let's just talk art theory, um, let's let's learn a little bit about who Mary Margaret is. Absolutely. Um, so I actually was homeschooled, and when I was kind of studying growing up, I just was always interested in making art, and studying art was something that came later on. Um, and so when I was in college. I started taking art appreciation courses, art history survey courses, and I just fell in love with learning about the history of art. And so I ended up majoring in art history for my bachelor's degree. And then I got my master's degree in art history. And over the course of those years, I just kind of have fallen in love with that discipline in particular. Um, and so that's kind of my history as a teacher with the interest in art history. So. Yeah. Now, so the the discipline was the term you used, you know, the, the discipline of art history. How is being an art historian different? Maybe it's not at all, but how is it different from being a historian in the general use of the word? That's a really excellent question. I get that from a lot of students. So when we're talking about history, it's very much based on kind of more, I, I think, as a visual person, it's more on text than anything else. And so when I'm thinking about art history, the reason I find it so fascinating is we are understanding history through imagery. And so we're analyzing and understanding the cultures that we're studying and these different historical periods by looking at their art productions and trying to understand it better and analyze it. And so it gives us a really awesome sort of visual reference to connect the text with. That's kind of the best way I think to describe it. Okay. Now, uh, let's introduce this, this class to everybody, How to Look at Art, which, I mean, that, that title right there is al already captivating, but it leads to all these questions. And then you have the magnificent subtitle there, A Study of Art and Its Hi History Through Art Theory. So maybe before we unpack the class, let's talk about what art theory is. Is that something we can define? That's a great question as well. So when it comes to art theory, the idea behind it is really looking at different ways for how to look at art, how to understand it better. And one of the the ways that I think is the best way of describing it is one that my um, professor in my master's degree was talking about. She said it's a way of having a conversation with a work of art. And so if you go to an art museum and you don't really know what you're doing, um, but you want to, generally what happens is you kind of just walk into the museum and you'll look at the works of art and you're trying to understand what everyone sees in it, but you don't really know how, right? And so what I think art theory really is, is it's a way for us to look at works of art and think more deeply about what we're looking at. So whether it's the formal qualities, so just the visual elements within it, or it's more about the contextual elements. So um, where it was made, what time period it was made. Um, it could have to do with, you know, religious sort of themes. Obviously that's a really, really big and important element of art. So um, the best way I can think of to describe it is really just trying to have a sort of silent conversation with a work of art um, when you are looking at it. That's the best way I think of to describe it. You know, and a conversation of, of any sort is is a, a, a practice of skill, right? There, there's a reason some people are better conversationalists than others, uh, but but you can learn to become a better conversationalist. So the idea here is that well, we will learn to better interact with with art as a whole and with with pieces that we come across. Absolutely, that's really my goal here, and I think that's something that is you know something that's very natural for some people. They kind of just naturally know how to do that. Um, but for the most part, it's something that you have to develop and sort of work on to try to understand. And when I'll take some friends or family members to the museum and I'm just spending time looking and it's so entertaining for me, they're just like, okay, I'm ready to move on to the next work of art. And so it kind of opened my eyes to the fact that some people want to understand, but they just don't know how to approach it. So that's kind of my goal with this class is to help people know how to approach art. 
Now, how might that, you know, so it's, it's one thing to me, I, I could look at what you're saying in a very specialized way. Like I want to be better uh, at looking at paintings, say. Uh, but you know, it, it, it kind of strikes me that that you're you're actually teaching a, a mode of thinking. What what sort of I guess, I guess applications outside of that narrow? Let me look at paintings in a better way. Would there be for this this mode of thinking? That's uh, you. You have such excellent questions. I love this. <laughs> Thanks. So, <laughs> I think one of the things that has drawn me to art history and art theory in general is that it really teaches us to be empathetic. And I think that's one of the big reasons why I love reading as well. It kind of helps us to know how to put ourselves in other people's shoes and understand what's valuable to them, what's important to them. Because I always talk about how works of art are really a representation of what's important to a person, a culture, you know, a religious set of people, you know, and so when you think about it that way, if you are trying to look at a work of art, even if it's not one that you like, and you take the time to think, why would somebody want to make this? What are they trying to tell me? Are they trying to tell me anything? You know, um, those sorts of questions are really important to me because I think that's really what it teaches us. And it's really one of those important things to apply to a lot of different studies in terms of critical thinking. It's just having the ability to be open-minded um, and sort of think about other people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. so we welcome your comments and questions uh, as, as we go through this. So at any time, you're, you're welcome to go ahead and, and, and quiz us or praise us or whatever else you're, you, you'd like to do. Thank you for being here to the audience. Uh, so let's go ahead now and unpack uh, this class, how to look at art, um, how is it structured, uh, I guess, I suppose by week, but then also also by year. And what, what goals do we have with this class? Absolutely, that's a very good question. So I think one of the most important things to me that I learned in my studies and just through my teaching experience, I do teach at a community college as well. Um, and I think one of the most important things to me is giving students the tools to sort of have a really good conversation about what we're discussing or looking at each week. And so um, one of my favorite practices has been to have an assigned reading about a different art theory per week. And so that's kind of how I'm modeling my class. And so I will be encouraging students to read and analyze these texts and then apply it to a work of art of their choosing. And so that's really going to be the main focus um, of our weekly meetings is we are going to have each student sort of choose a work of art or a couple of works of art to look at and sort of try to apply those theories in how they look at the works of art. And so that's really what it's going to be in sort of a conversation where we can see if we agree, disagree, um, what other people think about it. Does this understanding sort of apply to this art theory practice or is this kind of off? It's not really on the topic. So that's really where I want to approach it. And um, my master's degree was one where I actually studied in Edinburgh, Scotland. And one of the big things in the United Kingdom is to have very important texts that we read. We pour over them, we analyze them, and we meet together and we discuss. And so it's kind of, um, you know, your teacher is in that role of a teacher, but more so it's about having a critical thinking sort of meeting where we all exchange ideas and practice our academic muscles, where the teacher's not just gonna talk to you the whole time, you have to kind of have input in the conversation as well. And right. so that's really what I wanna base it off of and kind of have that seminar model for mine. Yes, which is exactly the flipped classroom model, the recitation model that 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 Kepler employs. And so when I look at your reading list here, absolutely a fascinating reading list. But as I look at it, I, I think perhaps the only complete work is Aristotle's poetics. Everything else is is essays and excerpts, um, which I, I I actually love that you know because it's this long list of all these essays with fascinating titles, um, you know Da Vinci, Derrida, um, Aristotle, Plato, um, yeah, just all these names. A lot of names I don't recognize. Um, so yeah, what's the uh, what what's the 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 thought process behind? this list construction, and then a practical question, uh, does it come with a packet? Like how do, how do we get these materials once we register for the course? Absolutely, great question. So um, the reading list was compiled with the sort of mindset of how did art theory develop? 
in the history of art, right? So we didn't have the whole idea of studying art's history until I would argue around the Renaissance, other people might agree or disagree. And so the course list is really sort of based on that. And then it sort of follows the development of the different theories. And so as you go on, they build on each other because each theorist will, you know, reference a previous one and talk about, oh, well, Derrida believed this, but Zizek believed that, you know, all these different people have these different opinions. And so that was really what I wanted to do is start with that foundation, look at kind of the earliest examples of how people thought about what we should do when we look at art and then sort of continue to build on that so that by the end of the course, the students will feel, oh, okay, I understand how they got from point A to point B, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Although it still continues to develop. Right. Um, and so in terms of actually accessing the resources, I wanted to make sure that it was not one of those situations because I wanted to have all of these really important texts, but I didn't want anyone to have to buy this. I, I don't personally think there's a great sort of survey art theory essay compilation of any kind um, that I actually wanted to use. And so I thought it would be more useful to just have the separate essays and have those different perspectives. But I wanted to make sure they were accessible and I actually try my very best not to make it to where people have to pay for the text because I think education should be, you know, in terms of publications, I think for the most part, that sort of thing should be accessible for the students. And so all of the essays are either available for free through membership on JSTOR, which is a very important um, publication database for art theory texts or just art texts in general. And then the other ones are in the public domain online. So you can either purchase a compilation that has them in there or you can just find it for free completely um, in the public domain. So everything should be free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it really sounds like you know, you're emphasizing conversation in this class, not only conversation with each other and with the teacher, uh, but with the materials as well, and 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 witnessing the conversation between all these materials, right? As as thinkers and artists approached art over the centuries, you know, how did they do that? And so, witnessing that conversation is an important part of the, of the process for the student. Absolutely, I think that's a really key sort of um, ability to have is to be able to sort of speak very eloquently about the subjects that we study. Unless it's maybe, I'm not sure if it's the same for mathematics or that sort of thing. I'm not as much a mathematics person, but I think for most of the things that we study in like the humanities, I think that's very important. Yes. Well, your uh, your course uh, objectives or, or in your about the course section, uh, you talk about topics uh, such as iconography, semiotics, originality, intentionality, and then there's a big et cetera there, right? So uh, I know you didn't intend uh, to, to use uh, those particular words as some sort of outline or class structure, but they, you know, they did kind of strike me as, as things really worth talking about. Um, I, I'd love to, to start by talking about originality, the idea oh. of originality in, in art. Um, is, is there even such a thing, right? So exactly. <laughs> I guess Mike could wax eloquent on it, but uh, I, sh I should allow you as the guest <laughs> to, to wax eloquent. But yeah, is it, what's, what is originality in art? That is such a humongous question. And I ended up actually writing quite a lengthy article about this for one of my master's projects, and I got really into it. Um, so just as a good application, I'll talk about kind of what I studied in that article because I think that's a really good way to show it or apply, apply it. So there's a photographer whose name is Vivian Meyer who became very popular within the past decade. Her photographs were discovered after she died. Nobody knew anything about her. She never showed anyone her photographs, but after she passed away, everyone was like, oh my goodness, these photographs are incredible. And so, what I wanted to do by looking at that is examine the idea of originality. So because we're looking at all of these photographs as self-portraits, because they are pictures of herself, you have to examine the idea whether are these self-portraits or are these just pictures of herself? So, Because there is a bit of a difference. And if so, do those different categorizations kind of put her in, is that more original if it's a self-portrait or if it's a picture of herself? So essentially the way of looking at it is there are so many different categories you have to look at mm. to sort of decide. So for example, you know, 
if you were looking at originality within the work of Leonardo da Vinci, is this original in general or is it original within Leonardo da Vinci's work? So you have all of those different categories you have to look at it in, but that the other part of it is there isn't really anything that's truly original because we don't know what the original is. So it's very much just this kind of um, endless debate that you kind of have to have with these works of art, but it helps you sort of think about it in terms of a lot of different contexts, if that makes yeah. sense. I, that yeah. was a very kind of obtuse explanation, but. <laughs> well, I, I think once again, we run into the word conversation, right? Because it's uh, not only are we conversing with, with the works of art, but the artist, himself uh, ha has has no way of abstracting himself into originality, right? We all exist in a context, in, including including the artist. Uh, it, it's sort of sort of fascinating to uh, to think about. Like, one, my favorite poet um, is someone who he was published a couple of times during his life, but he chose uh, to, to. He was a Jesuit priest, and he decided that being published was bad for his vanity. So he actually just wrote poetry that he shared with his friends. Uh, this is Gard Manley Hopkins. Gard I thought that's Hopkins. who you were talking yeah. about. I love him. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, but uh, so a friend of his, the poet laureate, actually, well after his death, published his stuff. And, uh, you know, that, that sort of story is, is always fascinating to me. This is um, Meyer, the, yes. the woman you were talking about. Uh, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about what's so compelling about her work, you know, having been discovered, you know, why, why were people reacting so strongly? Well, because she kept it a secret and they didn't understand why. And so they thought all of these photographs were so fantastic and so original in that particular time period when she was taking pictures. It was the late 1950s and 1960s predominantly. Mm -hmm. And, within that particular time period, these were very kind of avant-garde works to be composing in photography in particular. Um, and so with that being said, why is it that she never showed anyone? So it's kind of that idea of the secretive element of it. And yeah. then also the idea of why are most of these pictures of herself? Because a lot of them are self-portraits. Right. So <laughs> or we think they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a, there's an element of romance to you know to stories like that. Uh, but then also it, it's interesting how how certain ages will will connect with other ones. I mean, there's definitely something I think here just at a glance to the idea of a selfie generation being fascinated by early selfies. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, I thank you for introducing me to uh, uh, to this artist. It's a fabulous uh, documentary about her. It's called Vivi Finding Vivian Meyer. It's really, okay. really good. So <laughs> Cool. I'll check it out. Uh, well, let's talk about intentionality. What do you mean by intentionality in art? So when we're talking about intentionality in art, it's really looking at did the artist intend for it to mean what we think that it means, mm. if that makes sense. So mm. if you look at a, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, so if you look at a Goya painting, for example, Francisco Goya, the Spanish painter, a lot of his are very dark, very dramatic works of art, intensely psychological on first look. Um, and so if you look at those, the question with intentionality would be, so when we're looking at this, you know, are all of those different sort of adjectives I just used very dramatic, you know, very um, psychological, were those intentionally part of the works of art or are, are, are we reading into that? And then there's also the question of, does the intent really matter or is it mm -hmm. more what we take from it, our interpretation and how we read it? So it's more about the viewer versus the artist or the presenter. So that's really kind of a very basic explanation. Yes, I mean this. This is where the 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 classic idea, which perhaps you wouldn't want to to bring in this phrasing, but the idea that art is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, you know, this is where you would 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 tackle that question. Exactly, and I think that's a really, really. I don't have a problem with that phrase just because. Um, if artists, most artists, um, didn't want their work to be seen, why would they make it? I'm sure there are exceptions where it's a private kind of way of working through things or sort of putting something in their mind onto a sort of visual, visual physical sort of thing. Um, but it's the idea of it being seen and sort of a viewer taking part in that and sort of making it their own through the experience of viewing and interacting with the work. Mm. 
Well, you know, our art has has uh, has a language or has languages, and so you know, the artist wants to communicate. I do, I do think that that there has in, in recent years been sort of a, a purposeful movement towards obscurity, towards narrowing narrowing the audience. Uh, to, you know, to sort of gain exclusivity, um, but you know, and and of course, you know, these are very flexible languages, different by culture. Um, you can invent new words in the in these languages, right? Uh, so I, I don't want to overstate that aspect of things, but the idea certainly is that the artist wants to get the art out there to communicate things, which uh, brings us to you know to, to these languages, to things like iconography and semiotics. Uh, maybe you could just, you know, instead of maybe tackling those terms directly, maybe we could do that, or maybe we could just talk about the language of art. How do artists communicate to to us? That is really one of the biggest things I talk about with my students. One of the very first things we do is we talk about how I my main goal is to make art more accessible. And that's because I love art and the art world very, very much, but it, that you can't really find a snobbier crowd of people anywhere. Uh, than art people, unfortunately, especially when we're talking about museums and art historians in particular. And I, I would know because I've interacted with a lot of them. And so I think the number one thing to me is to kind of democratize the arts, make it more for the people. And one of the number one ways of doing that to me is to give people the vocabulary, like you're talking about those terms and the different sort of art speak that you need in order to actually even read those little plates next to a painting or a sculpture, all of those sort of descriptions that you find, they all have those kind of obscure terms that a lot of people are not familiar with. And so one of the very first things we will actually be doing in the course is studying some of the most important sort of terms that you need to know in order to sort of understand the different texts that I'm requiring that they read. And that's just because I think that's really a foundational part to it. And as long as you have those basic skills, you can kind of find your way with the other terms. But it is one of those frustrating aspects where a lot of these art terms are in other languages, mostly French, Italian, and German. Um, and so for people who do not speak those languages or don't know them that well, it can be incredibly intimidating. Um, and that is something I encounter quite a bit with my students. So I try to break down the words, what they literally mean in English, and then sort of show them how it applies with the work of art. Right. Okay. Well, you have you have Jacques Derrida here in 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 your reading list. So how how do you how do you interact with him in, in this class? So Derrida is one of those who is a lot like the other sort of more obscure, well, not obscure, but they write in an obscure fashion. Mm -hmm. um, art theorists or just theorists in general, like Slavoj Žižek. I talk about him a lot because he's very fascinating to me, but. Um, the thing with Derrida is that one's going to be a much looser conversation because he never really arrives at any conclusions about <laughs> anything. Yes. Um, so with the, so with like the most recent um, sort of publications with these things, the ones that have only recently been translated to English, like Derrida. I think one of the most important things is to a consider, you know, this was originally written in another language and uh, of necessity that really does change the nature of the work. But two, it's okay if you don't have an ultimate conclusion. The ultimate goal with this is to just ask questions and if you have to answer them with another question, that's fine. As long as you think critically about the question and it kind of makes you ask more questions, that's good because it's constructive and critical thinking, I think. Yeah. Well, let's talk about iconography now. Um, so it, it's something that you guys talk about in the class. Uh, I, I guess I have some pre-follow-up questions. <laughs> I already have some follow-up <laughs> questions in mind. And I don't even know what you're going to say, but uh, just the idea of talking about iconography uh, is, is, is interesting to me. So yeah, let's. Uh, how, how do you guys approach iconography and, and use, use the idea of iconography in this class? So essentially, it's just going to be an overview of how some people have used iconography to understand works of art. It's one of the earliest practices in terms of how we sort of take apart a work of art and look at it. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Jan van Eyck painting, the Arnolfini portrait, but it is one of the more famous examples of how to look at iconography. And that's because 
within it, there are so many different elements that people interpret different ways. So these different icons or images that have different meanings. Yeah. So whether it's the woman that has this green dress, does this mean, oh, it's because she's fertile or what is the green? Does it mean she's rich? And then you have a little dog at the bottom and the dog is for fidelity and faithfulness, you know, and then there's a sort of chandelier at the top with a candle that's lit. Is this the presence of God? Like, all of these different sort of symbols that could have different meanings. And some of them are clearer and some are a little bit more just kind of argued about on a regular basis because they could have multiple meanings. So it's really just sort of taking a work and looking at those different elements and seeing what you kind of come out of it with, what your interpretation of the image is. Right. And, you know, I, I was curious, you know, the reason I had questions ahead of time but didn't want to ask them, I was curious to know, you know if you would be using uh, the term iconography uh, in a strictly sacred way or, or not, and you're using it in the more general uh, philosophical sense. So yeah, let's let's unpack that a little more. This is the painting you were referring to? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so so where is their iconography in, in this piece? So well, you talked about it a little bit, but now we have yes. the visual. Um, so yeah, w w if, if you say this piece uses iconography, I don't know how you would phrase it, but... Um, how would you then unpack that for, for me, the student? So we would look at what these different symbols or icons within this work of art actually could be telling us. So it would be breaking it down by each of the different elements, whether it's colors or the actual objects or people within it and what that tells us. Does that make sense? Yeah. So <laughs> you know, basically what you're saying is that there's a language and that we're being encouraged to interpret that the objects or the portrayal of the objects has a specific message for us. Exactly, and it's kind of trying to understand whether there is a specific message or if there mm -hmm. are multiple messages and which yeah. one is correct. <laughs> right, so we might ask, well, why are their hands positioned the way they are? Exactly, and the, it's interesting you were talking about the religious ideas to it. Um, aside from the candle, we also have often in works of art, different hand symbols, right? If you have in Christian art especially, or even in Buddhist art, for example, hand symbols or hand gestures are very important in terms of iconography because they mean different things. So that's just one example as well. Very cool. Yes. Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Oh, well, you know, my wife is teaching a, a few art classes uh, this this coming term, uh, and you know, I, I think that that learning to interact, you know, what, studying art is often seen by many people as, uh, well, I guess I might say highly elective, right? <laughs> like you know, this class is is an elective; it's a humanities credit, but you know looking at the visual arts and learning to interact with, with visual arts is of great philosophical value and therefore of great formative value. And, and I do think that, that I wish that, that more families would prioritize it as a part of, of the formation of, of, of their children, of the education of their children. Now, you, you made a transition, you, you homeschooled <clears throat> through high school and then in college was when you really got passionate about studying art. Did you notice, um, well, a brain change? Like how, how did your mind change as, as you kind of dove into this a little more? Well, originally I wanted to study studio art. That was what I wanted to do was make art. And I still really love doing that. And I'm very much an amateur, but I do enjoy that. Um, but when I was studying, I made the transition to college by going to a community college. And that's where I took an elective course, the art appreciation course. And my teacher just was fantastic. And she's the reason I want to be a teacher is because she kind of really ignited that interest more so in me for this particular study. Um, but growing up, my parents had a very sort of interdisciplinary, excuse me, I can't talk, interdisciplinary approach to um, looking at whether it was literature, music, or art, it all kind of fit together. And so that's kind of how I originally kind of fell into the subject of looking at art. I grew up watching the Sister Wendy Beckett tours, if you're familiar with those, mm -hmm. um, where she would walk around a museum and look at a work of art, interact with it. And so when I went to this art appreciation course, and that was exactly what we were doing was looking at works of art that way, I was very excited. I didn't really even know it was something that you could do um, as a job. 
And so that's when I started um, talking with this teacher about it. And then I took the art history survey courses and I was, I couldn't stop. I had to keep going. And so that's really kind of where it all started. And, you know, like I said, I, my parents had us going to museums from day one. I can't remember not going to any museums. And so that definitely sort of sparked my interest, but what really sort of pushed it into my sort of career and my passion was when I was in college, so. Yeah. Well, talk to uh, talk to the, the history nerds among us for, for a moment, uh, you know, because I, I would consider myself one and you've clearly approached art history uh, through a love for art. Uh, but how might taking an art history course as someone who, who loves history? Right. I, you know, I, they're, well, they're, they just I love getting into the texts and into the context of certain cultures, et cetera. So, you know, what would for, for a history nerd? Um, what, what, why would I love taking this class? That's a really excellent question because I think it takes a lot to convince history yes. studiers or students, I should say, to <laughs> actually want to be interested in art history. And it's because I find people who are kind of historians are very much like you said, they're very text oriented. And I completely understand that because as a visual learner, um, even though I love to read, I catch on much faster by looking at images. But I think one of the really helpful parts to this class is really it's the same drive that we have as art historians that historians have, which is to understand people and their motivations in the past, right? Mm -hmm. And so it can add a lot more humanness to the discipline of studying history, I think. Um, and historians can disagree with me, I understand. Um, but I think that's really what it is because when you are confronted with those images from the past, it really does kind of add a lot more of that human nature to it, I think. Yes. Because with history textbooks, when I was in like high school, I still studied history, but it, it wasn't my favorite at that point. And I think that was largely because my favorite textbooks were the ones that had a lot of illustrations. I really liked yeah. to see the people and what they were doing. And so I think that's really one of the helpful elements to it is kind of understanding people, but seeing it a little bit more um, because, you know, obviously we didn't have photography before about the 1800s, right? And so it's one of those things where we actually are able to see more to it, so. Yes. Well, you know, this is reminding me a little of a, of a conversation I had with George Harrell, who's one of our history professors and, you know, sort of his concern to humanize and contextualize history for for students, because there's a, it's so easy to get to get lost in numbers and even lost in in text. And you you talked a little earlier about I think empathy was the word you used, and so you know, I think that that many disciplines suffer from an over expertise, and and art history is is not accepted from that list. No. Um, I think a lot of art historians. Uh, could tell you a whole lot about a painting and where and when it was painted, but not tell you what was going on in the city at the time. You know, I think there's a lot of, but you know, all these disciplines become so specialized and it, you know, a, a classical education is supposed to be integrated. And so I, I think something that already starts, it's not art, it's not history, it's art history. You know, we're already beginning by integrating. And I think you know, that's one of the things that can set, set you up for success as you're learning the important art of empathy and the important art of critically being able to put yourself in the shoes of other people and understand their ways of thinking. Absolutely, I think that's one of the most important parts of it. And I think a lot of people are surprised by that. They're like, oh, I didn't know you could tell this much about X, Y, or Z by looking at this work of art. And it's because you have to learn it. But when you do, it's incredibly rewarding and um, hopefully, you know, I, I have problems as well with the art history world being a little bit too confined for my taste. I think there should be kind of more, if not a survey approach, at least, you know, it, like you said, it's having this specialization. Oh, that's not my specialization. I can't comment on that. So I think it's really important to kind of approach it from a broader perspective and knowing about a lot of different things, whether it's Eastern art or it's Western art or whether it's really old or really recent, I think it's just important to kind of keep an open mind. Mm. Well, as we close, I would I would love for you just to just kind of give a, you know, there might be some repetition in that in, in this, that's that's cool, but I'd, I'd love for you to give a sort of a, a thumbnail pitch for this class. Uh, why should I sign up my child for how to look at art? 
Well, because I think, you know, as I've said, it's really helpful for all of us, especially when we are growing up to sort of think about other people and where they are from and their different perspectives. And as Christians as well, I think that's something a lot of us could learn is to sort of know more about other people's religious beliefs. And that's really foundational in art and sort of their history, the development and why they believe so strongly in what they do, because it gives us better ability sort of to talk with other people about these things in an educated manner. And I think studying art is a really foundational part of that. And it can really sort of also teach us about a lot of different things. We'll talk about music and literature together with these things and talk about how these sort of complement one another. And it's just really gonna be hopefully a class that teaches students who may not even like art that much to actually find it, if not their favorite, at least interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my goal. <laughs> All right, so how to look at art, a study of art and its history through art history. We've been with Mary Margaret Holcomb. Thanks for being here, Mary Margaret. Thank you so much for having me. So just stay on the line. Uh, we'll uh, we'll say goodbye to everybody, and then you know we can hang out a little bit and chat afterwards. Uh, we appreciate everyone uh, who's been here, and have a great day. Bye.